I'm here in the garden just picking a few more veggies uh, and I'd love to show you different types of fermenting and so I've got here another couple of kiwis I'm going to get and I'll show you how to make a cucumber kimchi I've got some cucumbers that are fairly even in size well as far as in the garden they're never even are they and I've already picked some coriander, a capsicum, and a couple of eggplants. And I think that's about it from the garden. But I'm also thinking, just before I go up to the house, I'm just going to uh, pick a few greens for the pigs while I'm here. They always love the greens. Tidy up the garden. I think they'll appreciate these. Come on, let's go. That won't be much of a feed for them, but it's at least some lovely greens, which is also very good for their diet. We'll see you in the morning, girls and boys. Well, I've got a treat for you today. I'm excited, you know, because look what I just got in the mail. It came yesterday. Oops. Ta da! My new pizza maker. I'm really into pizzas lately. And this pizza maker just makes the best pizza. And I'm thinking now to make some nukadoka. It's a Japanese ferment and it's based on bran. So it's a dry bran ferment. And the aim of this is to get vegetables such as mushrooms. And I've got my things from the garden here. We can do eggplant and some capsicum and just having them roughly sliced up and buried in this bed of bran will pickle them and the flavor is so enhanced that it makes a perfect topping for a pizza. For the rest of this video, I'll be showing lots of other different types of ferments, but let's start with Nukadoka. Now I've already made some preparation. This is two packets of wheat bran and I've toasted it in the griller. And that's the first step towards the preparation of this dry bran ferment. So now we go on to the next step. And we start to prepare the liquid part of this ferment to moisten the bran. So we start with a slice of bread. And this slice of bread will be broken up into tiny pieces. And it will be absorbing the water mixture. Plus all the flavors we're going to put into it. There it is, that's one of my loaves of bread. I can smell it, it's very good. And then I've got some water here, some filtered tank water, and just pour some water in to begin with. We can always adjust the amount needed. And now it's a matter of putting the flavors in this water because that will determine the flavors of that dry bran ferment. To begin with, because we are fermenting, I'm going to, ooh, did you see that? Did you hear that? <laughs> I'm going to put in some water kefir because water kefir is very bacterial and yeasty as you could hear. And this will be the pickling aspect of the bran. And now it's a matter of putting flavor in, some soy sauce, Oh, 
we need salt and lots of salt. The salt will help to preserve those vegetables. It's around 200 gram of salt per 500 gram of bran. You see I'm very accurate with my measurements here. Well, what else can we put in? I've got some of my homemade sweet chilli sauce. So we'll put some of that in to get a bit of zing into it. Now we'll put some of this chilli sauce in here. Yum, yum, yum. And I've got some of my homemade miso. Look at this. Miso is made from soybeans and rice and that's been fermenting for a long time. This one would be close to two years old. So we'll put in a pretty good amount of the miso. It's going to be a bit like a witch's brew already, isn't it? And then of course we can put in some garlic, some ginger, We've got some turmeric from the garden. So let's get all that in there too. So let's just swish it all around. Holy gosh, you wouldn't want to drink this, would you? And now we'll put that into our toasted bran. Let's see how we go. It's going to absorb all of this and I'm sure I'm going to have to add some more water to make everything just that little bit moist. Oh yeah, it needs quite a bit more. Well, I can feel the moisture coming through now. getting close. So there's enough moisture in here now. I can just squeeze a few drops of water out. So this is the first stage of the ferment of our nukodoka. And it will take about 10 days or so for all of this bran to be inoculated. So we have lactic acid and other probiotics that are present within this bran. And a daily stir helps to distribute everything throughout. Okay, I'll show you the next step when it's done and I'll come back to it in 10 days. Well you know it's about 10 days later and I've just checked my Nukadoka box and I can smell it's actually become lactic and a bit of pungency about it. So I'm going to start putting the uh, vegetables in the bran bed to pickle and as mentioned before I've got some eggplants, a capsicum, some mushrooms and I found a bit of zucchini I had in the fridge as well. So now it's a matter of just cutting them up quite coarse. So maybe two good slices of zucchini. Um, half of these button mushrooms. And big chunks of the capsicum. And then the eggplant can also be done in fairly big chunks. I like them diagonal. And of course they've got to be easy to find back again. And now we can start to bury the vegetables in the bran bed. And I'll just do it in little rows so I know approximately where they end up. It's just so simple and so much fun to do. And of course the longer you leave it in there, the stronger it will pickle and flavour. So it doesn't necessarily go soft, but it just becomes lactic. And it actually preserves it. So these mushrooms will be 
in about one third of this area here. And once you're ready to use them, well, then you do have to forage for them and rinse them under the tap because you don't want to eat the bran, of course. So you clean them under the tap and just drain them for a bit. And then they're ready to put on top of your pizza. The flavor, wow. You didn't know that ordinary old veggies could taste this good. I'd like to show you another vegetable ferment. Do you remember I picked these cucumbers out of the garden? Well, I'm going to turn them into a cucumber pickle or a cucumber kimchi. And my preference is to leave them whole. And that's why I chose a tall container to contain them all. You can cut them open and scrape out the seeds and then salt them and squeeze them off their juices and then do the pickle. But I'm just going to leave them whole because it'll take a lot longer to pickle but they can last for many, many weeks in the fridge. If you cut them open or even score the sides, well then they go mushy very quickly. So I'm simply going to prepare the liquid in this fermenting jar by putting in enough filtered tank water. And I can always top it up if I need more. I use it for so much of my fermenting. Just a little shot in there is enough. Whoop, that's plenty. And now it's just a matter of flavoring and I love adding soy sauce to all my ferments. And we need to have a bit more salt than the soy sauce can give, so I'll just pack in a bit of salt. Oh, maybe add a scant teaspoon to start with. And I'm thinking, I love chili. Look what I've got here. This is the Korean chili spice here. And not only do I use it in kimchi, but also in the carrot pickle. So just a, a very scant dessert spoon of the chili powder. And give it a bit of a stir. And a bit of a taste test. Yeah, just a bit of warmth, enough salt in there. That's going to be good. And then you just pop in the puis. Oops, it's a little bit too much even, so I'm just going to pour a little bit out. We don't need them to float up. We need them. Yep, okay, they're going to be submerged. And it's pretty good fit in there. And I've got a little bag here with some water, which I'll put in there as a weight to make sure that it doesn't oops, a bit too much, that it doesn't pop up above the water line because it will take a few weeks to sit on the bench and pickle or ferment. And you just eat it when it's to your liking. It'll take about three or four weeks before it starts to soften up a little. And that's because we kept the skin whole. Now, previously we had a dry bran ferment with our vegetables. And then I showed you how to make a wet ferment, an anaerobic ferment with vegetables such as the cucumber. And now I'm going to show you a fruit present in a anaerobic ferment in a jar in liquid. I've got here a cup of raisins that I've soaked and I've strained off the water. And now I'm just going to put it into the blitzer and pulse it so it just breaks up the raisins. And at the same time, I'm going to add some whole peppercorns and some coriander seed and just break that up while I'm pulsing the raisins. Ooh, where's my favourite chilli spice? There it is again. Let's put in some of that as well. Because this raisin chutney is sweet and savoury. The raisins will retain their sweetness, but with all that pepper and the chilli, it gives it that pungency as well. It's a great condiment for the barbecue meat. It just goes hand in hand. All right, well, let's give that a bit of a blitz. Just pulsing. Some of that coriander. 
coriander here. It's, it's good to be quite generous with it actually. Uh, this is the main reason I grow coriander in the garden. Because it's just such a lovely recipe. might just need a little bit more water. Just want it a little bit more fluid. You can add mint instead of coriander. It's uh, quite effective as well. But I do think coriander has the winning edge. Final taste. Mm, it's going to be really good. So uh, now I've got my nifty little fermenting container here. Kind of like the one that you have your beetroot in so you can lift your little basket out and keep the liquid behind. So I'm going to pour that in here. There we go, put it snugly to bed and leave it on the bench. 24, 48 hours, depends on the weather. And uh, when you feel that there's enough acidity, that lactic acid, uh, then it's fine to put it in the fridge and it will keep for weeks, months. It just stays really good for a long time. So next time you have a barbie, you know what else to put on the table. Look what I've got here. This is a camembert cheese made from cashews. So this is a ferment based on nuts. So a typical vegan cheese. How exciting, it's actually fermented. And I'll show you how it's done. First you need to soak two cups of cashews for at least four hours or overnight. I'm just going to strain off the water and I'm going to put the strained cashews into the blitzer and macerate it as fine as possible. We don't want any gritty bits in the cashews. All right, well now I've got the lovely smooth cashew paste in the bowl here and I'm going to add the two cultures. And this one here is a cheese culture. And I'm going to add just a little tiny bit in here because this culture will actually grow within this cashew base. So that's plenty of culture there. And that will give the lactic acid that it needs to actually preserve and to mature the cheese. And this is the magic ingredient here that grows that white mold cover over the cheese. And this is how much I'm going to put in. And that also is plenty. So after mixing the cultures in, it's just a matter of putting it into this little spring form uh, tin. And then once it's been sitting in the fridge for about a week, uh, uh, then you can carefully release it and allow it to firm and dry out more until you can pick it up without damaging it and then it might help just to put it into uh, a little container to have a lovely little microclimate to give it the humidity it needs to successfully grow that culture over your cheese. It's as simple as that. It just takes some time for it to mature and to grow the fuzzy white mould and it's just been sitting in this little container to encourage the mould to grow over the cheese. But it's got to such a stage now where I can wrap it up and just leave it to mature somewhat more for another couple of weeks or so. And then it's ready to eat. Wow, can you see some life in there? I can see it bubbling. It's certainly fermented. What is it? Well, I'll show you. 
Are you familiar with polenta, maize meal? You'll find it on all the supermarket shelves. A lot of people see it, but don't really know anything much about it. What the heck do you do with this stuff? Well, I'm going to show you what I do with it. So this is a liquid grain ferment. And uh, it's simply polenta that's been poured into this container with the addition of water and, you guessed it, <laughs> a dash of water kefir. I'm going to be telling you about water kefir soon, don't you worry about that. But in the meantime, I'd like to show you how I make my fermented polenta fingers. So I'm going to pour some of this uh, soaked and fermented Polenta into the saucepan. We can just keep that a little bit later. The longer you leave it, the more pungent the taste becomes. And so we've got some of this polenta with probably enough water in there now. I might just add a touch. It just needs to swim a bit because the next step is about cooking it into a porridge. The thickest porridge you've ever made in your whole life. And I'm also going to add a dash of salt. It just tends to be a little bit boring if there's no salt in this once you're ready to eat it. Good pinch of salt. Well, let's start cooking. Oh, look at that. See, it just can't be any thicker than it is now. And that is the sign that it's ready. And the next step is to just dump it out onto a clean marble slab. And spread it out what you can with the wooden spoon. Some lovely consistency here about it and just let that cool off five or ten minutes and then we'll do the final step ready for eating after this I've got the frying pan on the heat now it's a mixture of lovely chili coconut oil and some extra virgin olive oil now you can see my polenta here it's cooled down it's only just slightly warm and now it's a matter of just cutting it into bars, see how it just lifts up and stays together? And just cut them into bars, ready. That's what I've got here. Some yummy fried polenta fingers. I think I'll have one of these and just tell you what it's going to taste like. Mmm. Lovely and crisp on the outside and soft on the inside. There's a very slight tangy background flavour. And there is flavour there. It's just fine to eat on its own. Mmm. We have a chair up with you. <laughs> and now I'd like to divulge my secret water kefir. Because this is one of my main ferments that I do because it makes so many other ferments. So this is my stash here. But the real reason I like water kefir because it makes a beautiful soft drink. I'm going to show you what this soft drink is. Oh, it's got gas. It's got gas. It's, uh, yeah, I think okay, not okay. It's pretty potent. Let's see. Nope, not. Very gassy. What are yeast in this water kefir? Whoa! I might just see if I can do a quick pour into this glass. There we are. Look at that. Whoa! This is the potency of water kefir. It's amazing because of its yeast properties, and that's fantastic to adding to a sourdough starter, but also full of lactic bacteria and lots of other probiotics that will help get other ferments started. So there you go, I've made a nice little mess on my bench, haven't I? But, I'm gonna have a drink. Mm. 
I love it. And it's made with some water kefir and my favourite juice blend. It's passion fruit, mandarin and apple. Now you can make up your own press juices or do anything you like. Tea. Uh, you can do chocolate and make it fuzzy, fizzy. So this is how we start making the first ferment water kefir. I'm going to pour off, got gas, I'm going to pour off the kefir water to reveal the water kefir grains. And four tablespoons of these kefir grains will make a batch of two litres. And I've got here a jar. There's actually a story behind this jar. I saw it with the um, capsicum roasted strips in there and I thought, oh, this would be nice. I can really enjoy that. But the real reason I bought it because I love this jar. So it's going to be my kefir jar now. I'm going to put the kefir grains inside my new jar and simply fill with filtered water and then add half a cup of sugar, it can be any sugar, I just take the raw sugar and then a teaspoon of organic molasses to introduce some minerals into the kefir grains. Switch that around and that's actually what makes the colour of the water kefir water. And then just put the lid on and set it aside for a couple of days and then it's ready to use. It's as simple as that. And so now we have our supply of kefir water and we're ready to do the second stage ferment to make our juicy, fizzy soft drink. Now I'll just make up two bottles here. Plastic. You could see how important it was to have plastic. We tried to get away from plastic but in this case I would not recommend glass. It's like ginger beer. Very explosive. So I'm going to fill the bottles up by about a third. Oops, I'm making a mess here. Why is it so messy? About a third full. That's enough. And now fill up with our lovely juice. Juice of our choice. Not quite full, you want to leave a little bit of headroom for the gas to build up and also to have a bit of a feel, a bit of a squeeze of the bottles now and then as it's fermenting to see when it's fully fermented and ready to pop into the fridge. Now this is not necessary but I do find it helps just to add a teaspoon of sugar to just um, have a little bit more kick in the fermentation. And that is important if you're doing something like tea or passion fruit that doesn't have much sugar in it. It just helps to do that second ferment. There we go. As tight as possible. And because I put a bit of sugar in there, I'll just give it a little shake. And then leave that, where are you going to leave it here? Leave it on the bench to ferment. And the second fermentation can vary in, in really hot weather, it could be 24 hours. In the cooler weather, it could take a few days. But all you do is just have a little feel to see if that tight tension is built up. And if it's not quite there yet, well, then the gas is still building ready to make your favorite soft drink. There you go. What a kefir. Well, so far I've been showing you ferments based on the water kefir. 
But now I'd like to share with you another type of ferment made with milk, milk kefir. I'm going to take the lid off and give you a close-up view. Because you can actually see the kefir grains, they float to the top and they stay there. And they change the whole structure of this milk. Kind of like a, a runny yogurt. You can see here, the cream has risen to the top. And the actual milk curd here has just started to split. And that's through the acidity from the lactic acid that's been forming up in here, consuming the milk sugars. So having your kefir milk is uh, very good because it actually uh, takes all the milk sugars out and gives you lactic acid in return. Now the next step is to separate the kefir grains from the milk and that's simply done by pushing it through a strainer. And I'll just work at pushing the kefir milk through the strainer and the actual culture will be left behind in the strainer. Oh, I can see the lumpiness coming through. And these are the kefir grains that I'm capturing back. Oh, they have grown since I last saw them. Wow, they've probably doubled in size. There's so much of it now. Wow, wow, wow. Have a look at this. And that's the thing with milk kefir. They are very vigorous. They just keep on growing, keep on multiplying. All right, well, I'd just like to show you how to make a new batch. It's as easy as making the water kefir. Now, we don't need this much milk kefir to make a new batch, but I'm just going to put it all in there. And that will certainly speed up the whole process. There's so much life in there. And then we'll get some milk. It can be any kind of animal milk. It can be goat, sheep, cow. It can be pasteurized. It can be raw. It's all a matter of choice. And so we've got the milk in the jar. And we just put it aside. Now, we're going to continue using our milk kefir to make sour cream. Does that turn you on? It's lovely. So this is our kefir. Look, look how lovely and thick it's become. It's like a, a bit of a, a runny yogurt. And now, I'm going to show you what we can do with kefir milk. We can actually turn cream into a thick solid cream and turn that into a lovely sour cream. And I'd like to whip it up and show you how wonderful and, and rich it looks. Really uh, strong and it'll keep its shape. But if you keep on uh, busy it up, it'll turn into butter. And that's what ends up being cultured butter. So I've got here a bottle of cream just any old cream from the supermarket and just put in some of our milk kefir, four spoons will do, put the lid on, give it a shake, voila, leave it to ferment on the bench until it's as firm as in this jar over here. Couldn't be easier, could it? Alright, well now I've got my fermented cream and I'm going to put it into the food processor to first of all turn it into some lovely whipped up sour cream. Oh, it looks so gorgeous already. I just know that it needs to whip up a bit. It's even nicer to eat. Lovely beaten up 
sour cream. It's gorgeous to eat. But I'm going to keep on whizzing it to turn this into a cultured butter made from this sour cream. Butter. Cultured butter. Voila. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this video. I know it's been a bit educational. It's so easy to ferment food, as you can see, and the health benefits are absolutely amazing. And the taste, the taste truly comes out of your food. Thank you for watching.